Hebrews 8 says that what our own faith is founded on better promises. If the promise of bulls and goats could give them that kind of power, what kind of power has the promise that was put in place for us by the death of God, the blood of Jesus himself? It is incomparable. Hi, this is Tim Gray, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion Santin, and welcome to another episode of Phrenesis. Today I want to talk to you about something we've titled, Looking in the Mirror. Or maybe, maybe to be a bit more direct, let's call it equality with God. Whenever I talk like this, people begin to get very itchy and very nervous because the Bible actually gives us and declares concerning the believer that God has made us equal with him. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we have taken the place of God, but he himself has said and done so many things that has placed us in his rank and file. To be equal with God, let me, let me show you a few things. To be equal with God means to be the, of the same substance that God is made of. Say it with me. I am made, if you were born again that is, I am made of the same substance that God is made of. Off. And don't just take my word for it. You will remember the Bible speaking about Jesus tells us in John chapter 1 that he was the word that became flesh. Now Peter tells us that you were conceived by the incorruptible word of God. God. <laughs> Jesus is the word made flesh. You, the believer, were also born of the same word that Jesus is. Again, that is why we're talking about equality with God. To be equal with God means that you have been made of the same race of God. Whatever race, we have the human race, the angels, I, I race in the realm of the spirit, the demonic um, um, entirety, I race. We are of the race of God Almighty. We need to pause here and think. Do you know what this implies? You and God Almighty, not, not the gods, God Almighty, belong to the same race by the workings of Jesus. But it doesn't end there. To be equal also means that only that which can defeat God can defeat Jesus you settle again i almost feel like saying at every point like david will say sila stop pause and think to be equal means to be his outright reflection god's outright reflection without any spot or blemish look at second second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 i'm reading now from the king james it says but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, glass here means mirror, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. He says when we look at this mirror, we are transformed into the same image. Let me ask you something. Does a mirror reveal to you your past or your future? Neither. A mirror reveals to you your present. When this scripture, what this scripture is indicative of, is that you and I are supposed to see ourselves as God's current reflection, not that which we are trying to be. You see, the whole idea when he says now that we are being changed into the same image, he's saying that if you will first accept that you are already the image, the aspect of your life that is not manifesting like that will also conform. We are not of them trying to be like God. We are already as God made so by the workings of Jesus on, on the cross. We're already as God. God and what we're expected to do now is manifest it. Oh, I'm not done yet. I think I want to read to you 1 John 4, 17. Right? This time I'm reading it from the message translation. Show, pay attention. This message translation was mind-blowing. If you have it, go see it for yourself. It says from verse, in verse 17, God is love. When we take a permanent residence in a life of love, we, catch this, live in God and God lives in us. Saints, this might sound outrageous and blasphemous. Please don't send me emails. Go check it for yourself in the Bible. He says we live in God and God lives in us. It means before Jesus came, died and resurrected, 
The, the Trinity was the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. We see that in 1 John 5. But after Jesus died and resurrected and you became born again, the Trinity changed. The Trinity is now the Father, his sons, which includes Jesus and the Holy Ghost. It means you and I are now part of the Trinity. It means the only power that is able to compromise us has to be a force great enough to split the Trinity. The reason why many of us struggle is because a part of our mind, we still see the mistakes that we make. We still see the areas that we stumble. We still have issues in our lives that you have been confessing the word, you are not yet seeing the outcome. And the devil is saying to you, come on, equality with God, part of the Trinity, maybe that belongs to some people, but definitely not to you. Saints, if you are born again, I will say this over and over again like a broken record. I want you to, to bump into me in the mall and say, that's the pastor that always quotes this scripture. I will quote it again. He says, we have been baptized into Christ, completely immersed in Christ. Saints, you are part of of the glorious mystery of the heavens. You are part of the Trinity. It means when the heavens sit and the highest authorities sit to make decisions, you sit there in that boardroom, not as a member, not just as a, a, or an observer. You sit there as a member with the ability to also vote. You can actually vote on the decisions that were made. Did you not notice that this was the old covenant and yet Abraham was being consulted about whether Sodom and Gomorrah should be destroyed? Maybe you've not understood how that occurred. He was actually being consulted. Abraham kept on saying, if, you read, if he's 50, if he's 40, if he's, he ended up at 10. Abraham did not, re this is the old covenant. Abraham did not realize that if he had just decided, do not go to Sodom, the angels would have gone back to heaven. This was a man operating under the old covenant. How much more now? You and I. Hebrews 8 says that what our own faith is founded on better promises. If the promise of bulls and goats could give them that kind of power, what kind of power has the promise that was put in place for us by the death of God, the blood of Jesus himself. It is incomparable. Saints of God, hear me. He has given us equality with himself. You need to take out time. We take out time for family. We take out time to watch sports. Take out time to just meditate on this thought. I have been given equality with God. Maybe the next time we meet, we will examine the areas of equality that he has given us so that you can fully appreciate it. But before I walk away, hear this, hear this. You have equality and you must let the devil know it. I'm done. This has been Tim Gray, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion Santon. I'll catch you again on another episode of Phronesis. Bye for now. Wow, I'm so excited to be here again today and I'll be continuing my series on We Are God's Masterpiece. Beloved of God, you are God's masterpiece. You are God's best. God can't make anything better. And that's why when Adam fell or God saw that Adam will fall, all the calamity in the world, all the sin, all the pillage, all the genocide, he still made man knowing how it will break his heart, knowing his son had to die on the cross. Why? Because he knew, just like Paul says in Romans 8, that the suffering of this present time, all the suffering and sin and chaos and blasphemy in the world cannot be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. There is something about the new creation. There is something about being in Christ that makes you beyond human imagination. That's why Paul also says, Eyes have not seen nor ear heard, that which God has prepared for them that love him. So, beloved of God, don't look at things from the natural. You might be passing through trials and tribulation. Be, Jesus Christ said, Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So to put it in brief, we have already overcome because his victory is our victory. And Jesus said something so profound. I mentioned this last week. He said, he that hears you, hears me. Hallelujah. That means when we speak, it's God speaking. 
when we make confessions or declarations, it has not less power than the power of the Almighty himself. Why? Because he is in us and his omnipotence is in us. That was one of Paul's prayers in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul was saying that the eyes of our understanding might be flooded with light that we might know. You see, most of Paul's prayers were not prayers to bind devils, not prayers to curse or break or all that. Most of his prayers for the church were for the eyes of our understanding, the eyes of our heart to be flooded with light because that's the greatest need of the church. It's not the size of the devil. It's not how much you are in debt. It's not how incurable the sickness is that matters. Why? Because compared to God, they are nothing. And because God is in you, compared to, to you, they are nothing. And that's why John says, we have what? Trying to overcome, hoping to overcome, praying to overcome, begging to overcome. Most of our prayers, we beg and we cry and we plead. Why? Because we don't know who we are. You know, if a general, if a general is given a command to a sergeant or a corporal, Will he be wondering whether the corporals will obey? No, no, why? He doesn't have to know the principles of faith or principles of imagination. He doesn't have to know 10 steps to answer prayer. What he knows is God the authority. That's all. That's all. When you know who you are and you know your authority, you will not wonder whether demons will obey you. You will not wonder whether the money will come. You will not wonder whether you'll be healed. You see, a great problem with the church there are things that have helped us for many years and decades that have helped the church for even centuries. But you see, God wants us to move to a higher dimension. He wants us to move to a higher level in faith. You know, I was brought up with, in the prayer ministry. I was also brought up learning principles of faith, confession, and all that. But when Jesus taught Mark eleven twenty three, 23, God told me, I heard clearly from God. He said, I was not just teaching the principles of faith. What I was teaching the church, the authority. I was trying to get my followers to, to come to my level. The primary reason that Jesus taught Mark 11, 23 was not just to teach us, oh, you need to keep on saying it. You know what? Jesus Christ did not pray that way. When he spoke to the fig tree, he didn't keep on speaking to the fig tree over and over again. When he said, I curse you, no man eat fruit of thee here for, ta, forever. He didn't keep on repeating it. He said it once and he knew it was done. When Jesus spoke to the storm, he wasn't practicing the principle of faith. Let's keep, storm, die, storm, stop, storm, peace be still. He didn't say it over and over again. And that's what we do. But there's something better than that. There's something better than knowing the principles of confession. And I'm not negating those principles. They do work. But really, it's better when you, 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 you invest time in confessing who you are and your identity so it becomes so real to you that when a challenge comes, oh, you just speak like a, a king. You just speak like a general. You know, just like a general knows, that my orders will be obeyed. My orders will be obeyed. And that's what the centurion knew. He said, Jesus, come to my house. But he said, no, he doesn't have to come. I'm a man under authority, and I have authority. And when I say go, they go. He didn't say, I have to keep on saying go, go, go till the servant goes. That's how we operate faith. We, try, we th think we need to keep on saying it, and then one day the mountain will move. No. Mark 11, 23, Jesus Christ was saying, whosoever shall command the mountain, just like a general, just like a ruler. It's the same word that the centurion used when he said, Jesus Christ, speak the word only. The same Greek word, Jesus Christ says, whosoever shall speak to the mountain. Jesus, the centurion said, speak the word only. And Jesus marveled and said, I have not seen such great faith. What I'm sharing with you, with you today is what Jesus Christ marveled at. This is the revelation of the hour. This is the fresh insight that you need to know that you have authority. You have dominion, and when you speak, just like when God speaks, when God said, let there be light, there was no doubt about it. God knew it will happen. Angels knew it will happen. The earth knew they had to obey. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We need to rise above just principles to identity. When we invest time in meditating on who we are and knowing our authority, then it will be a piece of cake. Then like Joshua, he can tell the son to stop. Did Joshua keep on speaking to the son over and over again? I'd like to repeat that. Did Joshua keep on speaking to the son over and over again, then eventually the son obeyed? You see, there is something I want to bring out here. We are like nomads that visit the promised land and raid it and take a few things, take some apples, take some sheep, take some cattle, instead of possessing the promised land. There's a big difference between visiting the promises and taking what belongs to you. When an army has occupied a territory, all they have to do is to resist. And God told me, 
that the promised land that belongs to us is Christ. You see, you can visit the promised land and take some apples. You raid it and take some apples. But when you own it, you own everything on it. You own all the sheep. You own all the apples. You own all, all the fruit. You own all the cattle. You own everything. You own all the palaces. You own all the fortresses. We have been like visitors to the promised land. That's how we operate faith. Today I need healing. I, need, I start making confessions. I need a financial breakthrough. I start making confessions. I'm trying to take something today and I go back to my normal thing. But there's a difference when you know that it already, it's already yours. When you know that as he is, so am I. When you know that Christ and I are one. His life is my life. I'm a joint heir with him. That everything that he has belongs to me of his fullness. John 1.16, of his fullness have I received. Those who have received the abundance of grace, taking ownership. That word received there is from the Greek word lambano, which means to take ownership, to take possession. Those who have taken possession of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, Romans 5.17, shall reign as kings in life. Until you have taken ownership, taken the Canaan land, and God told me the Canaan land is Jesus. Until you have taken possession, that Christ is in you, you have everything that he has. Then you, you will begin to reign. And that's why Christians struggle. We are visiting, not possessing. When you possess your identity, that's taking Christ, that I and Christ are one. Everything he has, I have. All that he can do, I can do. Then you will reign. Jesus Christ took possession of the fact that God and I are one. He said the Father and I are one. That is taking possession. Not like trying to get the Father to move. Knowing that when I move, the Father is moving. When I speak, the Father is speaking. There is a big difference between principles and possession. Between identity and trying to get. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to get healed. I am healed. I'm not trying to get rich. I am rich. I'm a joint heir with Christ. When you begin to think that way. So just like what the man of God said. We are not trying to be healed. Divine health is I am the healed resisting sickness. I am the one on the throne resisting failure and poverty. I'm not trying to reign. You see, we are trying to rule. No, you move from authority. We don't move to authority. The church are moving to authority, moving to victory. No, we move from victory. We move from authority. We move from identity. We function from identity, from dominion. And no devil can stand against you and I. God bless you. And keep the switch of faith turned on. Hello, welcome to Phronesis. My name is Pastor Ezekiel Atang, and I'm taking you on the relationship segment of Phronesis. You are highly welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Last week, we began to talk about dealing with self, I mean, trust issues in marriage, dealing with trust issues in marriage. And we took our scripture from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 11, the heart of our husband God safely trust in her so that she, he has no need of spoil. So where trust is absent, there will be spoil. We discussed quite a number of things last week regarding trust. And, to, and you know, we, we, we began to talk about how trust dies. How trust dies. We said, number one, trust dies by letting out family secrets, confidential matters that are supposed to be between couples, and is let out to the public and sometimes can be used against a spouse and so on. And we said, number two, trust dies when you side outsiders against your spouse. You side outsiders against your spouse. We said, defend your spouse in the public and deal with the matter in the secret. And number three, we said, trust dies when you expose your spouse to your family members to deal with. When you accept insults, or, you know, against your spouse from family members without a word from you, without a word of caution or something of that nature. That will kill trust. Number four, trust dies when you hide things from your spouse. When you hide things from your spouse. Keeping secrets from your spouse is a major cause of distrust. When your spouse doesn't seem to know you anymore, Things that should be, you know, should be common knowledge between both of you is hidden out and hidden from your spouse. Especially when your spouse gets to find out those things from outside sources or elsewhere. Things that you should have told your spouse, your spouse gets to find them out from somewhere else or from someone else. That will kill trust. It betrays trust. It kills trust. So you want to be open to your spouse. 
you want to, if there is any matter for which, uh, uh, you know, if your spouse hears it outside, it will grieve them, then make sure you take the responsibility to let your spouse know about those matters head on. Let them hear it from you. Or will they be disappointed? Yeah, they may be disappointed depending on the kind of information. But at least they will be able to say of a truth that they can trust you. You may have disappointed them, but you have kept the trust. Very, very crucial. Don't let somebody outside blackmail you towards your spouse or blackmail you to your spouse. Make sure your spouse hears those things from you directly. Number five thing where trust dies is when you hide financial things or dealings from your spouse. When you hide finances, when you cannot trust your spouse with your finances, it can be a major blow to your marriage, can cause a major blow to your marriage. When you are stingy towards your spouse, especially when you are generous outside, <laughs> when you are stingy towards your spouse and you are generous outside. You kill trust. You just kill trust. That makes your spouse withdraw. I want to be by themselves and so on. Very, very important. And then let's look at number six reason why trust dies. When you do not keep your word, that is to say you lack integrity because the word integrity is from the word integrate where your word and your actions match each other. So when you lack integrity, you will kill trust. You don't keep your word. When you say a thing you do and, the, you know, by the time they look at it, you have not done it. It keeps piling up and piling up and then your spouse doesn't feel they should trust you anymore. That is a great, great setback. Hallelujah. And number seven, when you become sexually unfaithful, when you become sexually unfaithful, that is one major blow that your marriage can receive that can exterminate, uproot trust in the heart of your spouse. It takes a whole lot for trust to be gained when betrayed through infidelity. It takes a whole lot to gain back trust when trust is betrayed through infidelity. Hallelujah. You want to make sure you fight, resist, and you challenge any attempt to, to, you know, to become unfaithful to your partner. There has to be such elaborate explanation that should bring your spouse to the point of serious understanding in order to make him or her willing to trust you again. And you know, sometimes it's very difficult to go through those things, to want to start explaining and explaining, and your spouse will probably ask, how did it happen? When did it happen? How many times did it happen? You have to answer all those questions. So you don't even want to go there. You don't want to try it. You want to stay away from the lane of infidelity, from the, from the, from the, from the corner of unfaithfulness. Stay out of there completely, completely, completely. Praise God. So trust me, could have died in any one of these seven ways and even more. But the question is, how do you gain back the trust? How do you gain back trust? I'm going to deal with just one today. And next week, we'll continue with the rest. How to gain back trust. Number one way to gain back trust is to be naked again. Be naked again. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, the Bible says, The man and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed. Okay? They were naked and they were not ashamed. That nakedness comes in two dimensions. The first is physical nakedness, bodily nakedness. All right? But the one that concerns this subject is transparency that's the second dimension of nakedness transparency total opening up total vulnerability you open up completely there is a way you open up to your spouse and your spouse will know you have told them all the truth hallelujah there is a way you open up and tell them everything but there's a way also you talk and your spouse will know you are keeping something you are still hiding something. 
when when distrust happens your spouse one of the things that happens to them is that they don't know you anymore they thought they knew you and then they see themselves that they don't know you anymore and so what they want for you to do is to bring them up to speed let them know you well if you really want your marriage to do well your marriage to survive and you want to have sound home you want your marriage to return back to normalcy you've got to open up to them completely let them know everything now when they get to know all that much they may want to uh take it out on you and all that but at least you will know you have tried your best to open up to dis have full disclosure full disclosure told them everything and that is how your marriage will be salvaged that is how your spouse will get to trust you again and that is how normalcy will return to your home i hope and i believe that this has blessed you and i want you to go home and give it a try and try with your husband with your wife and see things go back to normal in the name of jesus christ i pray for you that god will give you grace to maintain trust between you and your spouse and the lord will give you grace to gain and win back the trust of your spouse in the name of jesus christ till i come your way again the same time next week i like you to stay tuned to phronesis and the lord bless you in jesus mighty name amen Let me tell you something. It's not a coincidence that you've just tuned in and you found me. I want to tell you something. You may never have another opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus. If you were to die right now, are you assured of an eternity in heaven? Well, if you're not, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Perhaps you're even a Christian and you've backslidden and some of your ways are no longer in line with the things that God has in store for you. Or perhaps you've never received Jesus. Either way, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. If you feel Jesus knocking at your heart, I want you to say with me, say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again for my sins. I receive you as the Lord of my life and my Savior. Holy Spirit, I welcome you into my life. If you've said that prayer, then you have just become part of God's big plan, God's big agenda. I want you to ask for my free ebook called New Beginnings. And if you have done that, I also want you to join a good Bible-based church and begin to grow in your walk with God. God bless you.